Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? If you guys want to stand up. Before we get started, I learned it's Christy's birthday. So does everybody want to say happy birthday to Christy? Happy birthday. All right, if you guys want to stand and join us, say hi to your neighbors. We're going to worship. The lyrics will be up for you.
pray with me this morning. Father God, we are so glad to be gathered today. 
God, as we finish this series today on how to pray, I pray that you would speak to our lives and where we are right now. God, as we finish this, would we be able to honestly pray in the same way that your son taught us to pray? God, would we be transformed and renewed? Would we walk out of here changed? Would we walk out of here looking more and more like your son, Jesus Christ? God, would you be with our kids in the back as the teachers are, are with them in their class? Would they walk out of here today with a sense of purpose, knowing that, that you love them, gaining knowledge of, of who you are and what it is that you have planned for them, Lord? Lord, we thank you and we love you and we just give you these, these next few moments in your name we pray. Well, hey, I am so glad that you guys are here. I tell you what, turn to one another, say, hey, I am so glad to see you this morning. If you're watching online, tell us where it is that you're watching from. We are so glad that you are here. Well, it's awesome to see uh, everybody here today, and uh, we're really excited about what God is doing in our church, and we have some cool stuff that's coming up uh, that I want to let you know about. First of all, I'm Michael. I'm one of the pastors here at Anchored Hope Church, and we're so glad you're here. And if you're new, we would love it if you would text this number on, on the screen. If you would just text hi to this number, um, there's going to be somebody that texts you back. This is our, our text in church number, and if you want to stay up to date on what's going on in the life of the church, whether you're watching on online or you're here in person, we would love it if you would text hi uh, to this number and we would love to get to know you a little bit better. And if you're here in person after service, uh, if you would go to this welcome center in the back of this room, we have a gift for us, uh, a way of saying uh, thank you for being here today. And we would love it if you'd do that. And something that's coming up in the life of the church, just a couple things I want to let you know about. Next Sunday, we're going to be honoring our graduates. We have four graduates this year who are graduating high school. And we want to give them a gift and recognize them, but also as a way of just celebrating with them and their families. Um, we are going to be having Sugar Fire come here to the church um, to give us some, some lunch. Hey, that's pretty cool, right? And so uh, next Sunday, bring some money with you. We have all the details on our Facebook page and our website. Uh, but we're going to have pulled pork and pulled turkey and ribs and smoked cookies and soda and all kinds of stuff. So it's going to be really fun. So make plans next Sunday to stay after church. And uh, if nothing else, it's a great time to just connect with other families and to hang out and to get to know some other people. So um, we're really excited about that. And then Memorial Day weekend, we will be online only. Um, so if you, we, we, what we want you to do is we want you guys to go and to spend time with your family and your friends, plan Memorial Day weekend to watch the service whenever you can that weekend. But please, 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 we want you guys to, to, to take this weekend to get some rest, to catch up. You know, it's been a, a, a different year, that's for sure, right? And so we want you guys to take that weekend and uh, join us online. And then the next week, we are going to be getting our series called the end um, on something I've never preached on before, the end of the world. And so I can't wait. Uh, prepare the emails because it's going to be a fun three weeks. Um, so I hope that you guys plan to be here for that at the very beginning of the June, the first weekend of June. It's going to be really exciting. But um, we're going to go ahead and dismiss our kids. Our kids are going to go to the back and and have fun in our awesome children's department. And like I said today, we are wrapping up our series called Hot Pray. So for one last time, I want you guys to watch this bumper video. Well, like I said, we're finishing up this series today, and I hope that you've learned something about prayer during this series. Have you learned anything about prayer? 
couple things, a couple things here and there, a couple little tidbits, a couple things to take away, right? And what we've really been looking at is how Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Because when Jesus prayed, he prayed in a different way. Prayed in a way that they had never witnessed or never actually seen before. I mean, when Jesus prayed, the disciples said, Lord, would you teach us how to pray like you do? And Jesus said, of course. And so, you know, as you all know, we, he taught them the Lord's Prayer. And, and what we've learned during this series, probably, probably one of the most important takeaways is this. Is that the way you pray says a lot about your view of God. Right? The way that you pray says a lot about your view of God. And as we've talked about in this series, it's very easy that when we pray to, to view God in, in a couple different ways. We, we could view God as a conscience cleaner. You know, when do I pray to God? Well, I pray to God when I've done something bad and I need to ask for forgiveness. And so God is, you know, we reduced God to a conscience cleaner. But God is so much more than a conscience cleaner. You know, God is not someone we just go to to be forgiven, but it's also, he's someone we also go to to make sure that we've, we've forgiven others as well. Or sometimes we treat God like a lifeguard, right? I mean, we come to God and he's like our in case of emergency God. Right? God, would you get me out of this jam? Oh, God, please, if you would just do this. I swear, this is the last time. Oh, please, God, save me now, save me now, save me now. Or sometimes we treat God like a genie in the bottle, who we just think we got to rub the right way. Christina Aguilera, 1997. Right? I mean, sometimes we treat God like a genie in a bottle, and we just think, oh, God, you know, if I have enough faith, and if I'm a good enough person, and let me show you my gold report card from church, and if I'm good enough, God will bless me, and God will do what I want. But the thing is, is that God is so much more than that. God is so much more than a conscience cleaner, so much more than a lifeguard, so much more than a genie in the bottle. And God has so much more to offer us. God doesn't want to just clear our consciences, but God wants to set us free. God doesn't want to just save us from situations, but God wants to help us grow into the, the plans and the purposes that he created us for. God doesn't want to just bless us with the things we want, but God wants to actually move us closer to him and move us closer into his will. And so there's so much more that God wants to do. And so prayer is so much more than these three things. Prayer, as we've talked about the last five weeks, prayer is about aligning our will with God's. It's about coming to our Father in heaven and praying honestly, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And it's about surrendering, right? We've talked about this every single week. There's a, there's a pattern of surrender when we come to pray, which is why it's so important that when we pray, there's privacy and there's intimacy, intimacy because there's so much that God wants to do. So as you know, we, we went through the Lord's Prayer and we wrapped up the Lord's Prayer. And then last week we talked about how to pray for other people. And if you weren't here last week, I wanted you to catch up on our podcast or our YouTube or our Facebook channel or any of that stuff. But there's one last prayer that, that I want to teach you today that I, I think is a great add-on to everything that we've talked about thus far. And then today we're going to kind of wrap it up and, and kind of put it all together and, and put a bow on it and then, and then move on. But I have a question for you that kind of sets up our conversation for the day. And the, the question is this. Have your views ever been challenged? Yeah, every, it's a rhetorical question, right? Yeah, because have your views ever been challenged? Well, of course they have. Your, when your views are challenged, what, what do you go through in those moments? What are the emotions you have? What are the feelings you have? It happens to us almost on a, a, a weekly basis now, right? With, with the amount of information that's shared with us. You know, the amount of information that's shared with us today in this digital age is more than m any other generation has had to deal with. And so when we have our views challenged, what do you do? And most of the time, we resist, Right? Or a way to put it is this. It's human nature to resist things we can't control or don't understand. And do you know why that is? It's human nature to resist things we can't control or don't understand. Because we have a worldview, right? And our worldview tells us how things work in the world. And so, so when somebody challenges our worldview, all of a sudden we don't understand the world. And that's why it's human nature to resist things we can't control or don't understand. Because all of a sudden, when we're challenged, we're not so sure if the world works how we thought it worked. And that is very disturbing to us. 
That's why whenever you went to college and you came home with a tattoo and a belly button ring, and all of a sudden you told your parents you're not a Republican anymore, you're actually a Democrat, you know what they said? They said this. They said, what are they teaching you at that school, right? And that's why your parents said that. Because they thought they raised you better. They thought you raised, they raised you right. That tattoos and belly button rings and being a Democrat was the devil. Right? And so you came home with those things and they thought, what in the world are they teaching you at that school? Because all of a sudden their worldview was challenged and upside down. That's complete human nature to resist that. Or how about when you started going to Anchored Hope Church, Right? And you started listening to the short, tattooed little pastor. And then all of a sudden, you went to your Catholic grandmother. And you were like, Grandma, I think that Catholicism may not be the way. And your grandma said to you, what kind of lies is that pastor filling your head with? Right? Because when our worldview is challenged, we resist. It's human nature. It's complete human nature to resist things we can't control or we don't understand. And the thing is, is that if you were in their shoes, you would react the same way. You would do the same thing. We all would. Guess what? The same way that you freaked your parents out when you came home from college and you had all these new ideas, your kids are going to freak you out one day when they come back from college and they have a lot of new ideas. And we all are resistant to that. And here's the thing that we have to understand about Jesus. Is that Jesus challenged everything everyone thought they knew about God. Which is why so many people were so resistant to Jesus. Because Jesus challenged everything that they thought. I mean, think about it. For such a long point in time, they waited for this Savior to come. And then when this Savior came, they got something completely unexpected. But not only did they get something unexpected, but Jesus just changed their mind about who God was. I mean, all of a sudden, God was there in human form, and he was totally different than they ever could have imagined. And it challenged their worldview. It, cha it challenged their theology. It challenged the way they saw the world. It challenged the way they saw God. It challenged everything. It, it threw them for a loop. They had such a hard time seeing what Jesus saw. There was even a point in time where, where Philip, he just kind of lost it. Philip was so confused about who Jesus was and what Jesus meant and, and everything that was going on that one, one time he just burst it out. Would you just show us the Father? Just show us the Father. He was just so fed up. He was done. And Jesus was always talking in parables and riddles. And so he's just like, just show us the Father. And you know what Jesus' response was? Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Don't you know me? Even after I have been among you for such a long time, anyone who's, who has seen me has also seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Jesus was saying to Philip, you want to see the Father? Well, here I am. I, I'm right in front of you. But Philip couldn't see it. Philip didn't understand that Jesus was God. There, on earth, in human form. How did he miss it? How could he not see it? Why did he not understand? And that wasn't the only time that even the disciples kind of missed the way things were. There was another time where, where Jesus explained to them. This was right before Jesus was taken and, and crucified and put on the cross. Where Jesus explained to them exactly what was about to take place. And this is what Jesus said. Jesus took the twelve aside and told them, We are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that was written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be delivered over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, spit on him. They will flog him and kill him. And on the third day, he will rise again. Now, Jesus couldn't have been more clear, right? Jesus couldn't have spoken more clearly about what was going to happen. He goes, hey, guess what? Everything that the prophets prophesied about, it is about to happen. I'm about to be handed over to them. I'm about to be crucified. But don't worry. On the third day, I will rise again. And these morons just went with him. They just continued to follow him. They just went with him all the way to Jerusalem. And then when things started to happen, they act shocked. They act surprised. They ran scared. What in the world? If they were going to be that scared, then why did they go with Jesus in the first place? It's because they didn't understand it. They couldn't see it. And quite honestly, when Jesus explained it to them, they didn't believe it. 
They didn't believe it was real. They didn't believe it was God. They could not see it for themselves. Jesus couldn't have been more clear, but it says right here in the very next verse, in verse 34, it says the disciples did not understand any of this. The disciples didn't understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them, and they did not know what he was talking about. They didn't understand, and they couldn't see it. Its meaning was hidden from them. Not because Jesus wasn't clear, but the reason that they couldn't see it is because of their preconceived notions about who God was and who Jesus was on earth. And they could not understand it. And they couldn't see it. Another time before this, they were traveling to Jerusalem, and they found out that there was a Samaritan village that wouldn't welcome them and let them stay there on their travels. And so the disciples, they actually went to Jesus and said, Jesus, you know, these people, they, they won't welcome us, they won't let us stay with them. And do you think it would be okay if we prayed, prayed down fire and brimstone on them and just wiped out the village? That's what they prayed. That's what they thought. They went to Jesus and go, hey, Jesus, do you think we can get a little lightning and thunder and like blow these people to smithereens? And do you know what Jesus said? Luke tells us, goes, but Jesus turned and rebuked them. Jesus turned to them and goes, you morons. Do you not see what I am trying to do here? You still don't get it. The disciples kept missing it again and again and again. No matter how clear Jesus was, no matter how many sermons he preached, no matter how many miracles he performed, all the way to the cross. It wasn't until the resurrection that they could see, clearly see who Jesus truly was. They just could not see what Jesus saw. And they couldn't see Jesus for who he really was. Which brings up a very, very important and interesting question. If the disciples missed it while walking right next to Jesus for three years, how much do you think we miss today? Right? Because we think we've got God figured out. We think we've got Jesus figured out. You know, I told you I'm preaching on the end of the world here in the next couple of weeks. And the reason I'm preaching on it is because I think we got a lot of things a little bit confused. But I'm going to challenge what you think. But a lot of us, we, we think we've got that figured out too, don't we? We think we've got the end of the world figured out. We think we've got God figured out. We think we've got Jesus figured out. But here's the thing. If the disciples missed it, walking right next to him for three whole years, how much do you think we get wrong today? A couple years ago, I preached a sermon during a very uh, politically heightened season. And there was a phrase that I, I came up with. I don't think of many very clever phrases that often, but this one, this is like, this is my one. Like, this is my one. I don't know everything about anything. And do you know what was amazing about this? I preached a whole series based on this phrase and based off, you know, some things that Paul said in his, his letters. I don't know everything about anything. And do you know what? This phrase actually offended people. This phrase upset people. What do you mean? You can't tell me that. I don't know everything about anything. Because we are so arrogant and prideful that we truly do think that there are some people and there are some things that we have completely figured out. And for anybody to look at us and go, you know, it's okay to think that I don't know everything about anything. Really actually offends some of us. Actually upsets us. But, but here's the thing I want you to understand. It's dangerous to assume that you've got anything or anyone figured out, including God. For you to think that you've got God completely figured out and that there's nothing more for you to rethink, nothing more for you to learn. For you to think that your worldview and the way you think about God should never be challenged or should never be put through a grinder and reconstructed and remade. For you to think that you've got God all figured out or you've got people figured out or you've got marriage figured out or you've got racism figured out or you've got the financial situation in our world figured out or you've got anything at all figured out is arrogance and what God is asking us to do is to not come to him as arrogant prideful people but to allow ourselves to knock ourselves down a peg and think I don't know everything about anything and you know what 
the people who were able to do that in their own life, the people who were able to get to that place, to take on that attitude, to take on that, uh, that, that place in their mind and in their heart, you know what they were able to do that everybody else wasn't? They were able to see Jesus. It, it was the people. Uh, the, those who saw Jesus for who he was, they, they humbled themselves and surrendered themselves. Humbled themselves and surrendered themselves. There's an, an interesting story. There was a, a Pharisee named Simon who actually had lunch with Jesus one day. And he's, it's, it's amazing because he's not treating Jesus like he's sitting at the table with God. <laughs> he's sitting there with Jesus and he's kind of having like a, a, a business lunch. And then all of a sudden, a woman burst into the room sobbing hysterically. And she falls at Jesus' feet and she begins to wash Jesus' feet with perfume and her tears. It's like a mixture. It's like she has a, a bottle of perfume, but at the same time that she's sobbing so much that her tears are just dripping down her face, and you can't tell what's perfume or what's tears, and she's just at the feet of Jesus, just pouring out herself, just washing his feet. And do you know what the Pharisees saw in that moment? This is what scripture tells us, what Luke says. It says, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man, talking about Jesus, he refers to him as a man. If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is. That she is a sinner. Isn't that interesting? This woman who apparently had some sin in her life, enough sin in her life that it, it broke her down. And whenever she knew that Jesus was nearby, she, she did something crazy and sporadic and didn't really care who, who saw it or, or what anyone thought of her. She ran into Jesus and she went to his feet. And as she sobbed and probably with one of the only items she had of value, took it and cleaned Jesus' feet. And the Pharisee, he looks at this, Simon, he looks at this and he goes oh my goodness if he were really God he would push that nasty woman away you know what the God that I imagine in my head he doesn't like people like that the God that I see in my head the God that I've imagined up the God that I have assumed if he were really here he would strike this woman down he would judge her, he would point his finger at her, and he would tell her to get away. See, Simon couldn't see it. Simon couldn't understand that actually that was God in human form there. And that what that woman was doing was the right thing. And, and Jesus, he does his Jesus thing and he, he looks at Simon and he knows exactly what Simon is thinking and he sees what Simon is doing and he sees the judgment on his face. And he, he tells a parable, but the message of the parable to Simon is basically this. Simon, your pride has locked you, uh, locked you in and locked me out. See, that's what pride does to us. When we think we've got someone figured out, when we think we've got God figured out, it locks us in, and it locks God out. And Jesus, though, he, he turns to this woman, and this is what he says to her. He says, your sins are forgiven. And the other guests, the people who were there, they began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? See, even the people who watched this, the people who viewed this as spectators on the sidelines, they looked at this, and they thought, who does this man think he is? This cannot be God. God would not behave this way. God would not be so merciful. God would not be so grace-filled. God would not treat a sinner this way. But yet what we understand now, reading this in the context that we're able to view it through, we know that that's exactly what God would do. That that's how God treated this, this sinner, this woman who came and sobbed at Jesus' feet. See, the thing is, is about our pride, it, it locks us in and it locks him out. When we think we have it all figured out, when we think we know everything about almost anything, it, it, it puts us in a position where we can't really move or grow as a person. And 
what we need to learn to do is to pray a different prayer. And this is the prayer that I, I want to teach you to pray, to, to add on top of what Jesus has already taught us to pray. Because I think if we learn to pray this prayer, that we would be able to understand as we grow and as we develop as, as individuals and people, we, we would be able to see Jesus for who he is and see what Jesus wants us to see. And, and, and where we get this prayer from is actually a prayer that we learned that somebody else prayed at one point. And this is the, the story that we're going to look at today. Um, Jesus, he was, in, he, he was approaching Jericho, and there was a, a blind man who was sitting there on the roadside begging. And when he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. And they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And so he called out, Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me. Now, what you have to understand is that in this moment, Jesus was actually heading to his crucifixion. Jesus was heading on like he this is one of the final stops before Jesus is taken, crucified, put on the cross and put to death. He's right there. I mean, he's on the march to the very, very end. And, and this this blind man, he, he cries out for Jesus. He says, Jesus, 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 because he's heard the rumors and he's heard the story. And he thinks, man, if I could just get Jesus to pay attention to me, to turn over here, I could get him to heal me. And so the story goes on, and this is what it says. Go ahead and go to the next. Uh, yeah. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Again, everybody thought that was, that was traveling with Jesus, that was with Jesus in the moment, that was in Jesus' entourage, said, oh, would you be quiet, you silly beggar man? Jesus doesn't have time for you. Jesus wouldn't stop for you. Jesus, Jesus is doing more important things. He doesn't have time. Look at all these people. He wouldn't stop for you, this poor beggar man. You are not of value to him. You are not worth the time for him. Please stop it. Just, just be quiet is what they told him. And he had to shout all the louder, mercy, mercy, mercy on me. And do you know what was interesting that shocked everybody, that surprised everybody, and really should shock us as well? Jesus stopped. Now, I want you to think about this for just a minute. Jesus is marching towards his moment. Like, this is the moment. This is the thing. We already know he's nervous. We already know he's a bit scared. We already know that this is something that has, has, has swelled up anxiety in him. But what does Jesus do? He stops. Isn't that incredible? Doesn't that tell you just how much Jesus loves you individually as a person? That even when he's, he's doing something incredibly important, he stops. But it says Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. And when he came near, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? And you know what he prayed? He said, Lord, I want to see. Lord, I want to see. And every single one of us, I think that the prayer we need to add on to the Lord's prayer that we've learned is, Lord, I want to see. Lord, help me to see the world the way that you see the world. Lord, would you help? What breaks your heart? Would it break my heart? Lord, what brings you joy? Would it bring me joy? Lord, would you help me to see you? And would you help me to see things the way that you see them? Because in my own arrogance and in my own pride, so often I miss you. Because I assume that I know everything. Because I assume that I've got it all figured out. And Lord, I'm coming to you humbly and I'm telling you that I don't. I don't have it all figured out. And so I'm praying, Lord, would you give me the ability to see? And to this man who is physically blind, it says this. It says, immediately, immediately he was, received his sight. But this is the amazing part. I want you to catch this. So immediately he receives his physical sight. And if you read many of the parts of the gospel where Jesus heals people, they always go back home, right? 
Jesus heals people and they go home. They go back and they, they get their life back. They go back and they get their, their property back. They get their family back. They get their job back. And they go home and they tell everybody about the good news of Jesus and what this guy Jesus did. But they always go home. But not this man. This is a very unique uh, perspective that you've maybe not ever caught before. This man, he received his sight and it says he followed Jesus. Now, this is so important because, again, what did I tell you? They are, he is on his final stops to being crucified, which means that many commentators believe that this man was there when Jesus was crucified. This man, when he viewed his, got his sight back, he didn't go home. He didn't take his old life back. He immediately became a follower of Jesus, and he followed Jesus all the way to the cross. And he watched what happened. To the man who had just healed him days before. Now that's interesting, isn't it? Think about what would happen if you would pray that prayer. Lord, I want to see. Lord, would you help me? Lord, I, your kingdom come. Your, your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. But Lord, would you, would you help me to see? Lord, I want to see you. Somebody uh, sent me a, a picture this week that upset me on Monday night. I want you to go ahead and put it up. This is uh, Mayfield Church of the Nazarene in Mayfield, Kentucky. And this, was, this is a, a church that's part of our denomination, unfortunately, um, in Mayfield, Kentucky. And this, this is their church sign, and this is what their church sign read last Sunday. It says, Mayfield Church of the Nazarene, thank God today your mother didn't abort you, is what it says at the bottom. Somebody sent me that on Monday night, and my mouth dropped. I showed it to my wife, Kate, and she gasped. And the first thing I did on Tuesday morning was I called the pastor of that church. Because not only is this a poor representation of this church and this community, but this is egg on my face as well because it's a shame and embarrassment to be a part of a denomination who would do this. And so I called the pastor and I just told him my name was Michael and I asked for an explanation and he didn't have one for me. He didn't see anything wrong with it. And so that's when I took to social media to kind of send a clear message to people. And you know what's amazing to me is I put this on social media and some people still didn't see it the way I saw it. There were actually people who kind of defended this and said, well, I, I am thankful that my mom didn't abort me. Or there's some people that said, well, yeah, that's probably not the best way to put it, but, you know, abortion is bad. Almost pretty much defending the situation. But, but do you know why I took so much offense to this? Do you know why this bothers me so badly and why I believe it should really bother other people? Is because when I saw this picture, this is what I saw in my head. I saw a woman who is around 35 years old, who at 20 years old had an abortion because she felt like it was her only option that she had. And for the last 15 years, she had been dealing and struggling with this pain, this feeling of guilt and anger. And she wondered what was the purpose behind this pain. And she wondered why she went through what she went through. And she wondered why she was even here in this world. And every single day when she drove down that main strip in Mayfield... She would see this church, Mayfield Church of the Nazarene, and every time she drove by it, as she's dealing with all of this pain and the struggles of guilt, she wondered, she just wondered, maybe if I went in there, I would get some answers. Maybe if I went there, I would... I could maybe find the love that I've been searching for. Maybe if I went there, maybe I, could, maybe I could find the acceptance that I've been looking for. Maybe, just maybe, if I went in there, I could find Jesus. And, and Jesus would help me with what I've been struggling with for the past 15 years. And then that same mother on Mother's Day, the day that reminds her every single year, not that she needs any reminding, of the painful decision that she made 15 years ago. She drives by this sign last Sunday and she says, it says, thank God today that your mother didn't abort you. And that moment, her curiosity turns to anger. And her curiosity 
turns to rejection. And I guarantee you, if that woman does exist, that she's never going into that church again. Now see, that's, that's what I see when I see this picture. And I kind of think that that's what God sees when he sees this picture. But yet some of us, we, we see this sign and we see it as a, a point in the wind column for God on, on the issue of abortion. Really? Really? See, we all see things a little differently, don't we? And none of us really know if we're right. Who knows? I could be wrong. This pastor, he certainly doesn't think he's wrong. Who's right in this situation? Who has the correct perspective on it? Who has the clearest view of what God would really want us to do in this situation? I don't know. Kind of depends on how you see things, right? And see, for us to see clearly, what we really, truly, honestly have to do is we have to pray. We have to, as Jesus said, go into a room and close the door. To have privacy and intimacy. And to pray this way. To pray, Father in heaven. Because he's your Father. My Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. To stop and to recognize that I am talking to the King of kings. The creator, the Lord of lords, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Who has invited me to address him as Father. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done. Not my will, not what I want, not my kingdom, but your will be done. And even when I pray for other people, God, you know what they want. Of course you do. But Lord, would your kingdom come in their life? May it be what you want more than it even is what they want. Your kingdom come, your will be done. And it continues. Give us what we need. Don't just give me what I want, but God, give me what I need. And if too much is going to take me away from you or to think that I don't need you, then give me less. God, only give me what I need. And forgive me. But God, forgive me only as much as I am willing to forgive others and lead me away from the temptation that I lead myself to all too often. And then to pray. And Lord, also, would you give me eyes to see? Lord, may what breaks your heart break my heart. And Lord, may what brings you joy bring me joy. If we pray this way, if we take the time to read the stories of how Jesus interacted with other people. Do you, and if we follow his command, most importantly, his greatest command, to love others as a, in the same way that we love ourselves, to love God and to love our neighbor, do you know what he promises us? He promises us this. If you hold my teachings, you really are my disciples. And then, then, then you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. Do you want to know the truth? Do you really want to know the truth? What if the truth disrupts your truth? What if what is true? What if the battles that we think are so very important to win, God actually wants us to lose? Yeah. What if, what if the fights that we think God wants us to have, he doesn't even want us to be a part of? What, what, what if the people that God thinks that we should interact with are actually not the people that we should even be around? What if, what if what God thinks is true is totally different than what you think is true? See, the thing is about this prayer, Lord, would you help me to see? It's probably going to require something of you. It's probably going to require you to once again, as we've talked about this entire series, surrender something to God. To lay down what you want for what God wants. For you to align your will with God, truly, is probably going to require for you to lay down what you think is true. 
for what he knows is true. But when we do that, when we learn what is true, that truth will set you truly free. So what do you want? Do you want to be right? Do you want things to be the way that you think they ought to be? Do you want to win? Do you want your beliefs to be on top? Do you want the way you view the world to be the way that everybody views the world? And are you so obsessed with it that you're willing to shove it down people's throat or even offend people there if that's what it takes? If so, you need to take a hard look at Jesus. Because the truth is, is that Jesus, when he was on this earth, he was nothing but grace, nothing but mercy, nothing but love. And yes, he told people to leave their old lives behind. But that's his job to get people there. Not mine. And not yours. So are you willing to pray how Jesus taught us to pray? And are you willing and brave enough to pray, Lord, give me eyes to see. And when he does, are you willing to follow? Even if it means following him to the cross. Even if it means losing one battle. But knowing that in the end, God wins in the end. Let me pray for you this morning. Father God. Father God, we come to you. We recognize your hallowed name this morning. Lord, we pray this morning your kingdom come and your will be done. Lord, would you reveal your will for our lives to us today? God, would you... Would you give us what we need for today? Would you give us what we need and would you forgive us as much as we are willing to forgive other people? And Lord, would you lead us away from the temptation that we lead ourselves in all too often? And God, specifically today, we pray, would you give us eyes to see? Would you help us see the world the way that you see the world? Would you help us to see other people the way that you see other people? God, we don't want to be like a Simon and miss it. We don't want our preconceived notions to get in the way. We don't want to assume anything about you. So Lord, today, would you, would you give us eyes to see? Would what breaks your heart break my heart? Would what brings you joy bring you joy? In your name we pray. Amen. You guys will stand and join us in this. Dream. 